Well, good morning. Good morning. It is uh, really so good to have all of you with us uh, today as we're actually concluding our teaching series that we've been in called Summer Soundtrack. Uh, For the last seven weeks, what we've been doing is uh, parachuting down into the book of Psalms. And uh, we're looking at different categories of Psalms. And the reason why is, uh, as we've kind of said a few times, the, the book of Psalms is a collection of uh, 150 different songs, poems, and prayers. You know what's wild about the book of Psalms? It was written over a thousand years. Like, just try to wrap your head around that. Like, those 150 Psalms took a thousand years to collect. How many books do you know that took a thousand years to compile? Like, like it, it, is, it is a spectacular um, book, but there's many psalms, and so uh, one of the things we're doing is we're just looking at the different categories. So far, this is a way of recap. We've looked at psalms of praise, petition, peace, pilgrimage, pain, prophecy. In our last week, we're sticking with the P theme because it felt right. Um, we're going to look at psalms of preeminence. Psalms of preeminence. All right, so let me help you because The word preeminence, uh, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that this is not a word that many of us use in our day-to-day language. Am I right? Okay, so just to make sure we're all on the same page this morning, preeminence, uh, what we're talking about, it's the quality of being better, stronger, or smarter than others. Uh, To be preeminent means that you stand alone at the top. It means that there's no one above you and no one beyond you. Simply put, to be preeminent means that you are the best. You get the picture? Okay. Psalms of preeminence. Let, let, let me try to explain this. Years ago, um, when I was in Bible college, I was probably at my physical peak. Okay. I, 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 I peaked early. And uh, back then, I would go to the gym often. Um, I I got out of high school playing football, went into college, and Bible colleges don't really have sports. Uh, So I thought, you know, I'm going to go to the gym, and I'm going to stay. I actually have a photo of myself back in the day, if we could just throw it up. Yeah. Um. (laughs) I don't know what's so funny. (laughs) That's that was me. <laughs> All right, it wasn't me. Um, but I was working out. Um, I had a gym membership, and uh, a buddy of mine, uh, Carl Patterson, who pastors a church up near Sarnia uh, right now, uh, we would go to the gym together. And, and Carl was just always a, a little bit bigger than me, a little bit stronger than me, and I was always kind of competing with him. And... Uh, this one day, we were doing something called max bench. Now, uh, for those who don't work out, basically, you know what like a bench press is? Uh, max bench is you're, you're not pushing to see as many reps as you can do. It's, it's you throw on as much weight as you can and just to see how much can you lift just once. You get the picture? So Carl goes first. He throws on like a ton of weight. And, uh, you know, he gets up there and he brings it down and he pushes it back up. And it's amazing. And then there was my moment, and and I had this moment that I thought, you know what, not today, Carl. (laughs) Not today. Today, I'm going to be the best. (laughs) I'm going to be preeminent. And so not only did I not take weights off, I put more weights on. (laughs) And so I get down on the bench, and I lift it up, and I bring it down. Now, that's the easy part because of gravity. Let me. (laughs) Now, the hard part is I need to... I need to push all this weight back up. And, and I literally, with everything in me, I am pushing. That bar is moving. The weight is lifting. And then all of a sudden, the bar stopped moving. <laughs> and I'm just left and I'm pushing. And Carl's spotting me. So he, he just says, Danny, do you need help? And I was so stubborn in that moment. I said, no. I said, I got this. And I'm, I'm, I was determined. And then all of a sudden, what happened was my left arm gave out first. <laughs> And so it goes, woof, like this. And all the weights, 5,000 pounds, that's not true. <laughs> all the weights fly off the bar. And these are like metal weights. You ever heard a bunch of metal weights fall on top of each other? It's just like, woof, clank, 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 clank. 
and then the weight distribution took over because there's still a bunch of weights on this side, right? So it goes, oh, ding, 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 oh, ding, 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 ding. The entire gym stops what they're doing and stares at me. I'd like to say stares at us. I turned around, Carl left. <laughs> he just walked away. He didn't want to be seen with me at all. And I'm left in the middle of the gym holding a bar that now has no weight on it. <laughs> it was humbling. <laughs> I, I, okay, I say all of that for, for, for this reason. In the same way, okay, that there are these moments that we go through in life that just humble us. <laughs> there are psalms that by design are supposed to have the exact same intent. Like, like there are psalms that were written with the sole purpose is that we would see just how much greater, stronger, and more powerful God is than us. When I say that we're studying psalms of preeminence, I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about God. Amen. There are psalms that by design are just supposed to cause us to slow down. Maybe back, like humble us in a way that we would look up in awe of the one who's seated on the throne. That's what we're going to get into today. If you've got a Bible, go with me to Psalm 93. This is going to be the last psalm we're looking at in this series. This is a psalm of preeminence. And what's really interesting about this psalm is that there's no human being mentioned in it at all. Uh, the only person mentioned in, in this psalm is God, and he's referenced by his personal name five different times, uh, Yahweh. Uh, whenever you're in the scriptures and you see the word Lord in all caps, that is Yahweh. This is like the personal name of God that was given to the Israelites. Here in Psalm 93, Yahweh is the only one mentioned over and over. It's about him. We actually, with this psalm, we don't know who wrote it. Uh, we don't know when it was written. Um, but what we, we do know is we do know why it was written. It, the, the reason why this psalm was written, it, it was to show us that our God is preeminent. That our God is on top, that he's supreme and he has no equal. You ready to go? Okay, verse 1. It's a short psalm. Here it is. It says this, right out of the gate. The Lord reigns. Let's just pause for a second. Sometimes when you're reading scripture and sometimes when you, you're even Psalms, it's like it kind of builds and then you kind of get uh, like right at the end. It's like, bam, the point. This Psalm's different. This, the first three words, the Lord reigns. Yahweh reigns. God reigns. He is supreme. He is, he is, he is in a league of his own. He is preeminent just right out of the gate. And then I, I love it. It says, he's robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. <laughs> all right, so there's a lot just in these opening verses here. But uh, first, I, I just want you to see it. It says that the Lord, uh, the Lord Yahweh, is robed in majesty. And in fact, it says it twice. Um, and what you need to know about Scripture is long ago when they were writing, they didn't have Microsoft Word. Uh, they didn't have a bold button. They didn't have uh, an italics uh, button. Um, excuse me while I get changed in front of you. Um, what they had was the ability to repeat themselves. And so all throughout scripture, uh, we see this, where the, the, the scriptures repeat itself over and over, and it's on purpose. It's never an accident, uh, because it's the author's intention to draw you in to what they're saying. Two different times, right in the very beginning of this psalm, it says that the Lord is robed. This is, this is my, my prop today. Uh, the, the Lord is robed in majesty and strength. The, the, the picture that's trying to be conveyed here is that God, this Lord Yahweh who reigns, the one who is supreme, the one who's on top, is literally 
covered in majesty and strength. Like, like majesty and strength is what surrounds him all the time. Nobody else can this be said of. Like human kings, people, we, I, Danny Gray, I can put on a robe, okay? I can throw this around my shoulders. Guess what? Danny Gray is not robed in majesty and strength. I'm robed in whatever, polyester. I don't know what this is. God is robed in majesty and strength, which just begs the question, what does a God like this do? If it's true that there is a God who is covered and surrounded in majesty and strength all the time, what does he do? Well, Psalm 93 just told us he builds things. Right? That's literally, verse 1 and verse 2, it, it, it says that, that he, he builds the earth establishes the earth firm and secure. He also establishes and builds his throne in the heaven. Does that sound familiar? Like to the very first words of the scripture, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. How does God do this? Because he's robed in majesty and in strength. And then I love this line at the very end of verse two. It just says this, Uh, The psalmist says, you are from all eternity. I I love it. It, It's the psalmist's way of saying, like, you, God, the one who's robed in majesty and strength, the one who is just able to speak and things come into being. He says, you're from all eternity. You, God, you, you don't have a beginning and you don't have an end. You operate somehow outside of the space-time continuum. Like, 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 you're just different. You know, um, if you just allow me to kind of nerd out for a moment. About, ten, you have to allow me. I have the mic. So <laughs> just endure this next moment. About 10 years ago, something changed in me. And I just became fascinated with space stuff. Uh, growing up as a kid, and I don't mean like Star Wars and Star Trek, I, like, although I do like Star Wars, but like actual space, how the universe works. Like in growing up as a kid, I wasn't interested in this, but somewhere about 10 years ago, it just, I'm fascinated by this. And um, I obviously didn't go to school uh, for this, so what I do is I watch documentaries. Uh, my wife can attest... Um, she finds it all boring. I find it fascinating. And I'll, I'll watch these documentaries around like, like how the universe works. And uh, you got all these scientists and physicists that are trying to figure it out. Because what they can tell right now is that our universe is expanding. It is just constantly expanding. Everything's moving apart. And which logically means that, that there must have been an, uh, an origin moment. There, there must have been something that started the expansion, right? So this has led a lot of scientists to try to figure out, okay, well, what started it all in the beginning? Like, what was it? And so the leading theory right now among scientists is that in the very beginning there was a very small speck of matter. Very, very tiny, maybe a couple millimeters wide. And it was super hot. And it was super dense. So hot and so dense that eventually this little tiny speck just exploded. And that's how we all got here. That's the leading theory right now. There's another theory. Well, actually, the first one. Let's just, it begs the question, doesn't it? Even if there was just a little tiny speck in the beginning, where'd the speck come from? Or or how, like, there's another theory that says, well, like, in the very beginning, there were just these gases that just existed, and then those gases kind of intermingled with one another, and and then eventually, you know, gases combine, and then boom, you know, here we are, which begs the question, well, where'd the gas come from? Right? My, my favorite, though, I was watching this one documentary on how the universe works, and this one scientist, he was, he was bold enough to say, you know, we don't actually know what actually caused everything to come into being, but he said, here's my theory. It was aliens. <laughs> and that was his... <laughs> and the person that was interviewing him actually said, well, where did the aliens come from? 
And he had an answer. He said, well, it was more aliens. <laughs> like, okay, do you see the problem? Yeah. Nothing plus nobody can't equal everything. I don't care what you reduce it down to, aliens, gas, or a little tiny speck of matter. Okay, you have to be able. It takes just as much faith to believe in a two millimeter speck of matter than it does to believe in God. Okay, like, I'm not kidding. Like, like it just, it flies against logic, right? Like, y- you have to wrestle with this. Like, so what we believe what we believe is that there actually is a God. And, and as the psalmist wrote, he is from all eternity. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. Like, like he is God. And because of this, he is robed in majesty and strength. And because of this, he builds things. He creates things from, uh, uh, fr- from like the, the smallest little particle to the largest star to the oceans, to the mountains, from the ugliest cockroach to the most beautiful human being, God created it all. God created it all. He is in a class of his own. No one can stand toe to toe with him or see eye to eye with him. He is the great and incomparable God. See it this morning, he is preeminent. That's what the scriptures is saying here. He is preeminent. As the song that we just sang earlier, you have no equal. No one is on the same level as you, God. And then I, I love as the, 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 the psalm goes on, the, the psalmist is just going to try to prove his point here with a very interesting metaphor. Verse 3, he says, the seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves, mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Anybody here ever been to the ocean? Yeah? Anybody here ever experienced the ocean waves? Yeah, okay, Lake Erie doesn't count. Okay, I'm talking ocean waves. Okay, there, there is something about ocean waves that just need to be respected, okay? You don't, you don't play around with ocean waves. Um, I, I actually learned this the hard way. Uh, 14 years ago, my brother Marty was getting married, and he decided that he was going to have a destination wedding in Cabo, Mexico, so we all, friends and family, we flew down to Mexico. I think that was actually my first time ever in the ocean. And um, for a few days, it was fun because you just have like the, the rhythmic waves coming in. And I could handle the rhythmic waves. But then there was one day, there was this really large storm uh, that was rolling in. And I didn't know they could do this, but they like shut down the water. Uh, all across the beach, they throw up these big red flags. And the red flags basically mean don't go in the water. Or like, you might die. Like, it's, it's really serious. So uh, my brother, uh, his friends, myself, we looked at those red flags and we said, oh, that's a nice caution for everybody else, not for us. So, so we wanted to go play in the waves. In fact, I don't even need to tell you, I have a video that I want to show you. The quality is awful. It's from 14 years ago. It was shot really far away. But you'll get the picture. Just r- roll the video really quick. Okay, so that's me, (laughs) just so you know. And then looks like a normal wave, right? That's about a 25 foot house coming at me. So let's see what happens when Danny Gray meets the wave. Okay, just watch, here it comes. (laughs) Yeah, okay. So let me help you next time you're vacationing. (laughs) If they put red flags out on the beach, don't go in the water, okay? Like, like, uh, honestly, that moment, did you notice that when Danny Gray went head to head with the wave, that the wave didn't fall backwards, (laughs) right? Did you notice that it didn't shrink down in front of me? No, it demolished me. 
I'm not kidding. When that monster hit me, I lost all control. Like it slammed my body against the ocean floor and ripped me forward for like 30 or 40 feet. Like, like my, like I've never experienced anything like that in my life before. And I learned something that day. Like the ocean is stronger than me. The waves are stronger than us. And this is what the psalmist is getting at. Like, yeah, yes, it's true that although the waves are stronger than us, God is infinitely more stronger than them. Right? Like, like, like God, like, like think, about, think about the story. I think it's Mark chapter 4. Um, Jesus is out in the water with his uh, disciples. They're in a boat, and the storm comes upon them. And uh, most of the people in this boat, they're seasoned fishermen. They know how to sail. They know how to navigate the waters. They know how to navigate storms. But there was something different about this storm. The wind and the waves were just next level. They're afraid. They think they're going to die. You remember where Jesus was? (laughs) He's sleeping in the bow of the ship, which I just think is hilarious. And so the disciples who think they're going to die, they go and they wake him up and they say, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to die? And Jesus is like, are you kidding me? Do you know who I am? And then remember what he does? He gets up and he speaks to the wind and the waves and he says, knock it off. You're scaring my disciples. Peace. And what happens? (sighs) Yes, the wind and the waves are bigger than us. God is bigger than them. Like the point the author is getting at here, he's, he's using this image to draw our attention to the point like God is in a class of his own. Like he's just preeminent. And, and then I love verse five. The whole psalm ends this way. The psalmist says, your statutes, Lord, stand firm. He's saying your laws your direction, your words, your commands, your ways, they, they, they stand the test of time. And, and then I love how the psalm closes with these words. It says, holiness adorns your house for endless days. Hmm. Psalm 93, it's an entire psalm built on the greatness of God. It starts by saying, the Lord reigns. That's the big picture. It says the Lord is robed in majesty and strength. He's, he's covered in an unreal amount of power. It says that the Lord builds things. He establishes things. The earth and the throne in heaven. It says that the waters are nothing in comparison to him. The, the biggest, largest wave in the world God can speak to in it would die in a second. And then the psalmist closes off with this thought that, that not only is all of that true, But when we're talking about the preeminence of God, we cannot miss the holiness of God. Holy uh, literally means to be set apart. Um, I think it was Wayne Grudem who said that just God is qualitatively other. Like he's he's just different than we are. Um, He's not made of the same stuff that, that you and I are made of. He's... He's not confined to time and space and matter. He's holy. This is why he can exist outside of time. This is why he can speak and the universe comes into being, right? He's, he's, in, a, he's in a class of all his own. He is holy. I was actually listening to a message uh, like a month or two ago, and this one guy just kind of made this observation that I thought was really good, and I just wanted to share it with you today. Like, did you know that in the scriptures, God is called holy over 400 times. It's true. Um, uh, Jesus calls the Father, uh, Holy Father. Um, The demons call Jesus the Holy One of God. And the third person of the Trinity, literally his first name is Holy. (laughs) Like, Holy Spirit, right? Like, it should kind of give it away. God is holy. Over 400 times the scriptures point this out. Holy, holy, holy. He is, he is holy. Do you want to know how many times the scriptures say that God is love? Twice. 
And it's in the same passage of scripture. It's 1 John chapter 4. Now, you'd probably think if you walked into the average evangelical church that the opposite would be true. You'd, you'd probably think that God is called love over 400 times and only holy twice, but it's just not true. Now listen, I want to be very clear here. I'm not saying that God isn't love. God is love, but what I'm trying to say is that maybe, maybe at times there's a little bit of an imbalance Maybe, maybe the love of God is, is a holy love. Psalm 93, this amazing psalm of preeminence, ends by pointing us to the holiness of God. The great incomparable God that is just qualitatively other. He's, he's something else. As as we close, what I want to do, worship team, you guys come on back up. Um, Psalm 93 talks about this throne that God established. And what I want to do is I want to take us to a different passage of scripture that actually looks at this throne in a little bit more detail. Um, John, in Revelation chapter 4, gets access into heaven, which is pretty amazing. Um, like it just says that there was a door and somehow he was given access through this door. And the first thing he sees is the throne. <laughs> like, well, actually, Revelation 4 says, and then there, there was a big throne. And, and in the throne, there was one who is seated on the throne. You have God enthroned in glory. The, the, the centerpiece of heaven is the throne of God. All throughout the book of Revelation, things are coming to the throne, from the throne. Everything revolves around the throne of God. And it's a fascinating picture. Like, it's a bizarre picture. Um, it, so, so you got God on the throne. And then there's just really tranquil things happening. Like it says that there's like this emerald rainbow in the background. It says that there's a sea that's like a sea of glass. Like it's, it just means like it's not moving. It's, it's so still that you can see your reflection in it. Like there's, a, there's an element of the throne of God that is just sheer peace. And then there's this other picture that, that, that's not peace. There's this other picture that it says lightning bolts are coming from the throne. Not around the throne, they're coming from the throne. This is peals of thunder can be heard everywhere, just echoing. It says that there's these burning torches all around the throne, which, which symbolize the, the, the Holy Spirit. And then it talks about these bizarre creatures. Many times we call them angels. The Bible doesn't. It just calls them creatures. And, and they're as bizarre as they come. Like, let's just call a spade a spade. Like, it says... One looks like a lion, the other like an ox. One had the face of a man, the other was like an eagle in flight. And that's not even the weird part. The weird part's verse 8. It says this. In the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. <laughs> Let your imaginations run wild for a moment. Okay? They're all got like different heads, six wings. They're massive, things that we would be super intimidated by. And then it says that they're covered in eyeballs all around and within. Why do you need eyeballs within? I have no clue. But they have them. Eyeballs everywhere. In their job, just so you understand, uh, all they do day and night is they just helicopter around the throne. That's all they do. Their body is like one giant GoPro, okay? All they do is just hover. And their job is to say what they see. They see everything. There is not one thing that goes on in this throne room that they do not see. They have the vantage point on every piece of it. And what's the one way that they describe God? Well, it goes on. It says, in day and night, they never cease to say, holy holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. 
Parkwood, this is the song that never ends. This is the song that, that, that never stops because there will never be a moment when God ceases to be holy. Every time they go around that throne, they come back again like, yep, he's still holy. Just day and night and night and day over and over again. And, and it never loses its meaning for them. Like this one who's seated on the throne is so holy, preeminent, strong, majestic, and powerful that they never cease to say ever that God is holy. This was not something that was happening just 2,000 years ago. This is what's happening today. As we sit in this room right now in heaven, there are creatures uniquely designed to see everything. And they never cease to say, yeah, the one word I have for him is holy. 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 Is Micah 6.8 it says that this is what the Lord requires of us, that we would do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. God's requirement of us is that we would walk in humility before the Lord. And I think sometimes what happens is when we lose sight of Psalm 93, when we lose sight of Revelation chapter 4, when we lose sight of the supreme, holy God that created everything, it's amazing how fast we can puff ourselves up down here. It's amazing how fast we, can, we think that we can lift the proverbial weight at the gym. It's amazing how fast we think, oh, those waves ain't got nothing on me. <laughs> you want to know how to walk humbly with God? You need, to, you need to run to the throne. You need to look at the... Like, seriously, go reread Psalm 93. Reread Revelation 4 and then tell me how awesome you are. It's not going to happen. Because these things are uniquely designed to do two different things, to show us the greatness of God. And it's in that moment when we see the greatness of God that all of a sudden we realize where we stand. So all of a sudden we have this very, like this keen awareness that man, he is just different. He's just power. He's God. He's God, I mean, Park, but honestly, just think about it. Like, like what, here's what's going to happen. I, I, I promise you this. Um, one of two things is going to happen. You're going to die or Jesus is going to return. Okay? That is a guarantee. And either way, there's going to be a day when we are going to stand before the throne. There's going to be a day when all of that stuff that John is stretching to try to explain, all the stuff that Psalm 93 is pointing to, there's going to be a day when we're actually going to experience it. What's it going to feel like to be there? What's it going to feel like to, to spend time in the presence of God? Like, when was the last time that you thought about this? I mean, like, honestly, in light of this, in light of this God enthroned on high, what else matters? Like, what else matters? The center of history, the center of humanity is not us, it's Him. Jesus enthroned in glory is the point. And He's calling the church, look at me, stare at me. Spend time with me. Join the song. We stand up to our feet. There is a song going on right now. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. It does not stop. It goes on and on forever and it never loses its meaning, ever. And so church, I just wanna call us before we leave, 
that you got an emergency run out. If, if you don't, please stay. Because right in this moment, we are joining heaven in the song that never stops, proclaiming the greatness of the one who's robed in majesty, the greatness of the one who can stand up on a boat 2,000 years ago and speak to a storm and say, be still, and it listens. This is our God. He is preeminent. He is holy, or simply as the song started, the Lord 